welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Zero Week 2023, the session on um, building energy efficiency and how we can improve it. Uh, my name is Glenn Rickson, Head of European Power Analysis with S&P Global Commodity Insights. And I'm joined today um, for a hopefully very exciting panel with Manish Kumar, um, EVP of Digital Energy, Digital Energy uh, Schneider Electric, and Mark Danzenbaker, CEO of Gridpoint. Um, so just to kick us off, I don't need to tell you because you're already in this room, but there are times when energy efficiency and the demand side generally can feel like a, a relatively niche topic. Energy efficiency, a hair shirt issue, more of an obligation than an opportunity. And when we walk around the Agora Innovation stage, you know, there's a carbon hub, a hydrogen hub, a lot of focus on CCUS, but that's only half of the story, clearly. Um, and when, when you look at the numbers, um, the IEA has reported that over the last, since 2020, there's been a trillion dollars of investment global in, in energy efficiency related sectors, and that there needs to be about 1.6 trillion uh, investment per year if we want to keep on um, target for the net zero ambition that, that we have. Um, so, like I say, it's a huge topic from a consumer point of view, potentially from an investment point of view, and also from a social society point of view. So I really want to kind of get under the hood of that topic today. Um, and just to kick us, kick us off, um, I'll, I'll address you first, Manish, but it's good to get your take too, Mark. What, what does you know, improving building efficiency mean in 2023, and, and how do you see your company and yourself involved in that challenge? First, uh, Glenn, uh, I, I want to thank Sarah Week for actually having this topic in this forum. You know, this topic, first my question was Sarah Week and building, what's common? But I'm glad that the, the topic is looked at of energy very holistically and buildings, which are key component of solving the energy crisis and you know, decarbonization is included in that. So coming back to, I think if you look at the topic of decarbonization, um, I think today we have two crises. One is obviously climate change is the big challenge in front of us. And secondly, uh, is the energy crisis, which is you know, causing energy prices to increase, also creating inequality in certain ways. And those two topics are interlinked somewhere. Right? Uh, now, if we step back, say building, I mean, buildings are 37% contribution towards CO2 emissions. And if you look at within that, 30% are typically in the design, build, construction sort of embodied carbon. And then 70% of the emission is produced during the life of the building, during the operations, right? And uh, with all the new regulations coming up, uh, bulk of the problem where we need to focus is existing building. By 2030, uh, a lot of the building that you know, will exist in 2030 exists today. And that's where we need to focus on so existing building. And uh, uh, I would say energy efficiency is one of the largest lever for us to focus on the demand side of the equation or existing building uh, that exists today, 70% of the equation. So the topic is very, very important. At Schneider Electric, we take it very personally. Uh, as you know, uh, we also have a building footprint. Uh, and scope one and two, big part of that contribution comes from making our own building efficient and our clients building efficient. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, if I can pass on to yeah, you. Yeah, I think we are actually quite aligned in our thinking here. And I also appreciate Sarah Week including this topic in the discussion. And I, I have a simple goal, I think, for this discussion for everyone here is to help everyone understand how buildings fit in in the larger picture here. And that picture is that we can't just focus on the supply side of the equation. That supply side of the equation is very, 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 very important. And a lot of the time dedicated at the conference has been about that. But we also have to focus on the demand side of the equation for a lot of reasons. I just came out of a, a session that was, was talking about the um, time that it's gonna take to get a lot of these new generation sources to market and the, the permitting and everything that's gonna take time. Meanwhile, we're adding demand and uh, we have to make sure that so we sort of balance that out. And so I would just say that you know, the logic tree here is if we're gonna decarbonize, and we must, then we have to focus not just on the supply side, but the demand side. And if you're gonna focus on the demand side, well, where are the sources? Where are the sources? And buildings are a big contributor, based on the stats that you just shared, I have very similar ones, um, are a significant contributor to the, to the emissions, and so you have to focus on buildings. But I would go one step further to say, well, not all buildings are created equal. This is a large, unique building we're sitting in right here today, but um, 
90% of commercial buildings are below 50,000 square feet, and 70% of them are below 10,000 square feet. And so in order to tackle it, we have to tackle all buildings, both big and small. And small is big uh, if, you tackle, if you tackle a lot of them. And so for us, what we think is important is to also not just focus on efficiency, but focus on efficiency and virtual power and demand together. Because if you focus just on efficiency, then you're missing the other opportunity, particularly in small buildings, to make demand flexible and tie that in directly to the grid. And that's really where technology, I think, can play a very, very, very essential role, is creating that connective tissue between the assets in the buildings, the buildings themselves, big and small, to tie into the grid, to also flex that demand at the edge, where the built environment is, where a lot of the emissions are, and if you're gonna focus on making the transition, you gotta, you gotta cover that demand side. Going back to that point that not all buildings are created equal, what, what do you see as the kind of hierarchy of value or, or hierarchy of challenge in terms of the, the building mix? Where is the, the most value now, the particular building type versus the, the hardest to, to, to reach, I think, Manish? I think uh, if you go back to 70% of the emissions are on the life cycle, demand yeah. side, right, yeah. produced, so we have to tackle that. If we break it down further, there are three main opportunities there. Yeah. One is we reduce the demand itself of buildings, so make it more efficient, directly related to the topic we, we are discussing. The second is we replace the supply, I think the point you made uh, as well, is bringing more microgrid locally and creating virtual power plant. That's another source of greenifying and efficiency by creating more flexible grid interactive buildings with the local generation. And third is, there are processes that happen within the building like heating, powered by, I would say, you know, oil and gas. I think there's an opportunity to electrify those processes. So I, I think where we see reduced demand, get that saving, get more supply side local renewable uh, generation, make that grid interactive, flexible, uh, buildings, and third is electrify your processes uh, within the building as well, heating being one of the biggest uh, process. And then there will be always still left, you can offset that with central sort of PPAs and so on and so forth. So those three or four areas are the big source. Yeah. Uh, and, and being, uh, uh, I would say, energy efficiency, I think we have so much advancement that have been made in digital technologies in the last 10 years with IoT, cloud computing, analytics, Energy efficiency, we know 30% energy is wasted. So we have a technology today to attack that problem. It's a question of leadership, actually, among all of us, you know, whether we can deploy that technology to attack the potential of uh, energy efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to kind of go back to that issue around, you know, the heating, for example, I mean, the last 12 months have seen, obviously, a global energy crisis. I come from Europe where we've seen gas and power prices rise to 10 times their normal value. Um, that has led to mandates on um, gas and power demand reduction from the European Commission. Obviously, you know, in a way, all three elements of that energy trilemma prong are being hit, price, um, security of supply, and also decarbonisation. But I, I wonder whether, you know, maybe coming to you, Mark, first, have you seen the kind of either the type or the volume of customers coming to you change over the last 12 months in light of that higher price environment, perhaps? Uh, absolutely. I think that, obviously, a a key theme of this week in the trilemma is affordability. Um, and what's happening is that we're seeing prices increase. We're seeing prices increase. And we can ask ourselves why, uh, and there are short-term and long-term factors for that. And I would say that as we make this energy transition, as we make this energy transition, we are fundamentally changing the power curve on the utility side, which has an impact on those that consume the power. So if we step back and think about that, well, we are changing the nature of the generation mix on the supply side uh, towards wind and solar, which creates an intermittency problem, which could be a whole session all by itself. Um, but as we do that, um, we're also adding quite a bit of demand. And when supply meets demand and supply is inelastic, we create uh, situations where, and I'm not an economist, but we create situations where <laughs> you have price increases and you have scarcity. And for the customers that we work with, the commercial businesses out there, what are they worried about? They're worried about pricing, they're worried about costs in an inflationary environment, and they're worried about reliability of power. And those two things are challenged for a lot of the customers I work with every single day. And so they're coming to me and saying, 
how can we take the edge off these concerns? And energy efficiency is absolutely a very, very important way to do that. And that means being in the building. That means driving the efficiency. And efficiency really has two sides. You're either going to you know, use the data. And what does digitization mean? It means using data to make decisions. And so you want to have the data in the buildings to make decisions about your, your profile and use of, use of those assets, but also decide which assets to replace, which is fundamentally what efficiency comes down to. Yeah. And that, that idea of data and, and measurement more generally, I suppose, I mean, one of the, the phrases that I've heard you know, repeatedly over the last couple of days is digital twin, the idea of you know, the value of data in itself beyond the cost savings and, and how it can improve processes. So Manish, how does that fit into to your kind of thoughts? You know, coming back to the, the point that you, you know, highlighted, Glenn, uh, uh, we have been working on energy efficiency for the last 10 years. But you know, really, in the last three, four years, the momentum, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to both uh, people's commitment and awareness on climate change as well as energy crisis, we have seen the momentum going up, right? And the way we have seen the engagement with client, we, we came out with a framework called strategize, digitize, decarbonize. And we realized some of the clients actually don't have starting point, where do we go actually? I am ready to make a commitment by 2030, 2035, 2050, but how do we get started, right? So we have a practice where we are helping customer in the strategize phase define the reduction pathways. And you know, as you said, every building is different, every portfolio of customers, building depending on the country, energy prices, location. So you have to have a very tailored reduction pathways. Second point is digitization. I think if you don't know what your energy footprint is, what your CO2 baseline, you cannot really make an improvement on that. So I think really helping customers define a baseline with digitizing their existing portfolio. And then is the decarbonization. So now I have a baseline, what do I do? What are the levers I should really deploy? And that's where energy efficiency levers with IoT, predictive analytics, and so on and so forth comes into picture. And I'll just want to make it very real example. We have a customer in the United States, 20 buildings, portfolio of you know, buildings in a campus. We exactly worked on those three uh, levers uh, in our framework. We deployed, uh, you know, they have 20 buildings. We deploy lots of metering infrastructure to start with so that now you know exactly what's my energy footprint, what's my CO2 footprint, and then on top of that, deployed uh, uh, eco-structure technology that's really helping them understand where are the inefficiencies versus compared to my similar buildings, where are the, the opportunity to act. And the result has been phenomenal. They are saving $1.6 million per year on saving of energy cost. They are able to meet their net zero vision. And their uh, energy consumption has decreased by 16%. So very real, tangible benefit achievable uh, with a customer like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like the benefits are clear, but there are also challenges in this sector as well. I, I guess one of the challenges may be the upfront costs sometimes involved in, mm -hmm. in investing in energy efficiency. So, so whereas there are clear long-term benefits, you know, as we've seen exist, you know, companies in the existential crisis in Europe for sure shuttering because of the, the energy cost issue. But, but maybe, Mark, coming back to you, I mean, the notion of um, uh, energy efficiency as a service almost maybe helps address the, those upfront cost issues. Yeah, I think that's a big factor standing in the way of adopting energy efficiency and getting, getting people to do things is the upfront capital associated with doing that thing. And so the obvious answer, sometimes, sometimes the answer is very obvious, which is don't make people pay money upfront to get things done that you want to incent. And I think that you know, we find with the customers that we work with, um, they're commercial businesses. They're commercial businesses. They're quick serve restaurants. They're retail facilities. They're, they're pharmacies. And they want to put their capital to work on growing their fundamental business. They want to put their money to work to add the next location or grow their revenue for each store, same store sales, if you will. That's what, you know, it's their personal bottom line, whether it's a small business or a, a, a global corporation. And so I think that we found that a way to drive adoption is to make them not have to put that money up front. And I think adoption of energy efficiency and really any technology that's going to move the needle, and we have to move the needle on the energy transition, is to make it easy for people to adopt. And that means subscription-based, zero down style, no capital up front. Subscription models is the way, particularly for small buildings, and the smaller 
down the tail of buildings you go. And again, most of the buildings are small. The further down the tail you go, the way to get the needle moved is to make it easy for them to adopt. Don't put any money down so that they can put their, their money into their, their revenue producing activities. And so the pitch becomes save energy, save money, be efficient, uh, be sustainable, which means in this context, reducing scope to emissions, help the grid and get paid for it. So these are all the things that, that if we want to drive adoption, we've got to make it easy for people to adopt it. We have to have the technology innovation, but we have to deploy technology too. And deploying technology means business models matter. Yeah. It, I've heard um, this business model described almost like an inverse power purchase agreement, which is a, a striking way of looking at it because, again, the European experience is that PPAs, corporate PPAs, have been such a focal point for attention over the last year. But this, this demand side is not on the radar to anything, anything like the same extent. Um, I know you guys aren't uh, directly involved in the residential sector, but I did want to spend a bit of time looking at the residen residential sector just to briefly you know, look at where the challenges there are. And maybe, maybe one way of looking at that is you know, related is the building stock. So you know, maybe with your experience from the commercial sector, what are the relevant challenges between kind of addressing new building and, and the older building stock in terms of applying energy efficiency solutions managed? And Glenn, if I come back, uh, maybe on the challenges, uh, you know, to complement, I think uh, the two challenges, I think, as a uh, industry we need to do is, one is, of course, changing the business model, you know, bringing these things as services so we eliminate the barrier to adoption from a CapEx model. Uh, here, uh, to complement what, uh, you know, uh, Mark, you were saying, is we are also bringing what we call energy as a service business model. So if you have a desire to build a local microgrid and you have storage microgrid and you want to have that interfacing with the building, you can support providing you a microgrid as a service. So really producing local energy and then getting the efficiency by interacting of that with the utility price of use. So that's kind of the one uh, business model uh, possible today. The second one is I think uh, a lot of customers have a hesitancy or lack of I would say education and payback. What's my investment for payback? I think we have a role to play, and we are doing that with the customer more and more, being very clear on if you put an investment towards energy efficiency, the payback is X number of years. And the reality is with the cost of technology going down, prices going up, it's much easier now to formulate some of the payback. And it's coming down to three, four, five years max uh, in terms of uh, uh, payback period. So it's becoming very real, good investment. Yeah. Uh, comparing with the residential, I think uh, the challenges, uh, one of the other challenges we see is the lack of skilled uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. We want to deploy these technologies, uh, uh, and that's where we see some of the challenges around skilled labor. We are taking it on our, ourselves as, as well, as an industry leader, training thousands of people across the globe, uh, making them skilled so that they can actually deploy these technologies as well. And then you know, the role of AI is coming into picture where if we cannot have lots of trained facility managers, engineers, technicians, mm -hmm. technology somewhere has to complement that. As a simple example, technology will tell you where the problem is rather than using the tribal knowledge which is in the heads of the people, experts. Also, what are the likely problems and likely solutions? If you bring that kind of you know, technology augmented, I call it my avatar, an expert avatar, Complementing that, you can also then solve some of those challenges. Yeah. Again, the solution is somewhere in the digital technologies as well. Yeah. Um, going back to the labor question, I mean, that, that is a key challenge in all areas of the energy sector. We're seeing it, I think, globally as well. I mean, again, going back to the experience of Europe, heat pump installation is, you know, it's accelerating, but it's still far short of where it could be. And a major dry, slowing, uh, slowing element there is the labor force not being there, not being trained. I think plumbers are the most in short, you know, most needed um, uh, kind of workforce type in Europe, followed uh, quickly by electricians. So, I mean, Mark, maybe back to you is, to, you know, how do we kind of solve that problem, lose the focus on that kind of need for, for, for labor force and, and maybe solve it through other means? Right, so yeah. I, I absolutely agree that the labor force to install the equipment and you know, the trend is going to be towards really essentially microgrids in, in micro sites and in all sites down, down the line. I think we're gonna see 
an increase in the distributed energy resources, which is another way to say the energy storage and the other assets that are going to be in a lot of the commercial buildings going forward, they have to get deployed, they have to get installed, they have to be tied in, and a challenge to the entire industry. The entire industry is going to be the electricians and the uh, labor force to be able to execute that work. So, and I will tell you right now, we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with it today and I, I think it's gonna continue that we get backed up on orders and it takes time to, to get things you know, through the system. So it's a real challenge. So, so one of the things is you know, continue to encourage the training of, of, of as many of those, those people as possible to do the work, but the other side of it is, well, you know, reduce the amount of labor that goes into each unit of work to get a site done. So I think that's where technology can also play a very important role. And so a considerable portion of our investment is into how do you make the installation process more seamless, simple, out of the box, and faster with standardization and tie-ins to a lot of the you know, key partners that we want to work with to make each unit faster so that you know, one crew can cover two sites in the same amount of time is another way to do it. So yeah. efficiency you know, to, to, drive, to deliver more efficiency. Yeah, and on, going back to the topic of microgrids, which we, which we think is a key part here, we think of energy efficiency as basically use less energy, but obviously it's not that straightforward, and interaction with the grid is a key component. There are times when the grid actually wants people to use more energy. Um, so, so maybe manage, you know, how, good to explore that in, in a bit more detail. What, you know, the, the value of demand shifting as a component of yeah. energy efficiency. And, and I would say, uh, uh, I think microgrid has a big role to play in the future of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are seeing concrete example, and, and I would like to sort of, you know, say in United States in particular, Lee, with the incentive programs with IRA, it's becoming big uh, theme for us. We are yeah. seeing significant acceleration. And when you put a microgrid with solar storage and then the automation control that can interact with your building systems, you know, technology inside the building and with the grid and all the use cases that are, you know, differential mm -hmm. pricing, you can have the opportunity to optimize both the demand, both the cost, and that can create a very, very uh, significant, I would say, uh, resource. Coming back to the point that you meant, you can actually think of building as a mini power plant that can be registered as a virtual power plant with a broader ecosystem so you can, can aggregate at that level and make that capacity available. So you create a much more greener, flexible, resilient ecosystem, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. linking with the building technology, but also with the wider grid as well. I'll share an example, uh, if you allow. Uh, we had a customer in Finland, uh, CityCon. They actually developed, and we worked with them to deploy a microgrid uh, in their shopping mall. And they have actually become net positive, not only net zero, but net positive. So they are able to optimize the tech, you know, system in a way that they can actually export back to the grid as well. So not only we can get to net zero, we can actually get to net positive with the, the, the micro grid technology. Yeah, and, and I guess, um, I think it's maybe fair to say that Schneider and, and Gridpoint maybe serve a slightly different customer base in that Schneider may be aimed for the larger scale in, in terms of building size, at least market, and then maybe Gridpoint has more of a chain-based customer base. Is yeah, that I think fair that's, to say? I think that's, that's fair. We have literally the same idea in mind to create basically distributed virtual power plants using buildings as a resource. Um, but there's a lot of buildings out there and there's different size of buildings. We tend to focus on the smaller ones. But I will tell you the, the same thing. Every deal we do with customers is not just about efficiency. It's about the demand side of the equation. And that's going to continue to become more important and a bigger part of the equation as we continue down the energy transition the level of uh, grid services programs, the real-time programs, the emergency programs, the carbon-based programs, they're all gonna continue to increase and we wanna allow our customers to participate in every single one at the right place, but each location is going to be a little bit different, but there's a lot of commonality there. And I just, maybe I'd summarize that by saying the key to efficiency is don't just focus on efficiency, do, do both. Yeah. Be behind the meter, be front of the meter, tie it in together, and that's the perfect role for technology yeah. to help it, drive that. And it feels like that, that kind of impetus towards demand side response is moving down the scale in terms of the customer size. So again, you know, in the UK uh, just this winter, we've seen National Grid, the, um, the system operator, launch a demand flexibility service that's open to residential users as well. Um, relatively early days wouldn't have happened without the crisis that we've seen in, mm -hmm. in Europe because that was essentially designed to mitigate security of supply risk. 
But, but going back to those kind of small scale enterprises maybe, and, and back to you Mark, is, do you see a kind of tension between the landlord and tenants in, in some of these value chains around uh, investment? We, we tend not to. We seem, tend to see alignment. Um, the customers we work with, they, they might have long leases and we tend to focus on short terms. Um, you know, we're not doing 20 year terms on you know, a solar project at the site. We're doing three to five year terms and that tucks nicely within the lease construct that our customers tend to have. Um, and our customers, you know, for them, they tend to be responsible for their bill and so that they want to sort of drive those savings. So there's not a, not a conflict there. Although I think there is opportunity for continued collaboration between the landlords, the REITs, and the tenants in the buildings. And I think there's a, quite a bit of an opportunity, you know, through REITs to, to deploy technology into these buildings uh, and probably be able to charge more to, on the basis of marketing a greener building. Yeah. I think that's a, a significant opportunity. And if, if I may, I'll just take the advantage of the mic just to say that I think that, you know, I'll paint a picture of where I think this might go is, you know, energy inflation has, has increased. We've seen these prices go up. I think we're going to continue to see that as we go down the energy transition. But I also think we're going to see a little bit of a, uh, a, a mind shift and we're going to start to see pricing programs based on the um, emissions of the generation mix at that particular time. And we're going to see customers, they're going to, you know, if you imagine the continuum, they might be focused on energy efficiency for the cost benefit, but you're going to want to see them sort of slide over and say, I want to control for net zero. And that's going to take knowledge of the grid at that particular moment. And we're going to see customers drive not only buying behavior, but control of their buildings in that fashion. And they're going to look for technology to help them do it. Yeah. Interesting. If I could compliment, yep. uh, you know, we are seeing real shift in the mindset. This contradiction did exist between owner and tenant. Owner is are not investing enough. Tenant has a desire to be, uh, and so who makes the investment? So, yeah. so there is that 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 tension existed. I think we are seeing a significant shift in the mindset, primarily because of two or three reasons. If I am committing to a scope one two emission science based targets. I want to be in a building that is going to help me meet that goal, right? So they are actually putting the tension back into the asset owner to say, I cannot lease 10-year building or lease for 10 years if that doesn't have a path to net zero, right? And with the new directives that are coming, I take an example of London and New York, I think roughly 60 to 70% of the building stock will not be able to meet 20, 30, energy efficiency, energy directives. So you have seven years to get there. Otherwise, those assets will be stranded assets because nobody's going to lease it. And you have a real financial risk at the same time as well. So I think that as kind of equation has changed, which means now you need to start deploying and renovate existing buildings yeah. to make sure it's a financially viable asset as well. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I'm conscious, so just a, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll open the floor for questions. So just uh, have your questions ready if you're able to. But before we get there, um, I wanted to explore the role of policy and, and government um, uh, to, to whatever extent you want to talk it through. But I know you mentioned the IRA Manish as a kind of key unlocking tool in Europe. We've had the Fit for 55 Repower EU, which has you know, targets for heat pump installation, um, energy efficiency targets, etc. Whether it's in terms of funding, carrot sticks, uh, long-term targets. What do you think the key kind of key things that government can provide are? Maybe if I go to both of you, but maybe start yeah. with you, manager. I think policy has definitely yeah. a role to play to accelerate the transition. And I'm actually very happy that governments are taking it much more proactive role, whether it's a IRA, which is providing uh, you know, uh, uh, tax reductions uh, on energy efficiency or on microgrid projects, you have a, you know, uh, credits available. Uh, same thing for Fit for 55 in Europe, you have energy efficiency directives. Same thing at a city level as well, like Boston, New York, some of the cities have emission caps, so if you exceed that, you have to kind of, you know, uh, pay for that. So I think all of these things definitely have a role to play in terms of acceleration, and I think it's driving the industry uh, to start taking action, you know. I, again, I, I take very basic examples. Today, many of the buildings don't have basic automation, control, metering infrastructure. That's not acceptable. In a world where we are looking for smart cars, autonomous cars, buildings should be equipped with basic technology of, I need to know where my energy footprint, carbon footprint, I have basic automation control, and of course, as you progress, you start to deploy new levers. Yeah, and 
a more positive view. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, the role of role of government here is very important uh, in policy to incent and encourage, um, not to pick winners, uh, but to create the the incentives through likely tax credits and and have the ability to let the market um, respond accordingly and help customers be more efficient and help drive the energy transition that way. Okay. Um, thank you both. Just give a chance for um, any questions. You'll, you'll notice that we're a panelist down, by the way, so you are the third panelist in the room today. We've been applying efficiency standards to the panel. We've cut them by 33%. Um, and we have a, a question at the back. <laughs> Um, thank you. So my question is for Manish. Um, are you seeing adoption by commercial um, or maybe also industrial building owners um, happen as fast as you had originally expected? Because seven years to uh, a landlord might seem like a long time, and you might think they should be hurrying a bit more than they are. So is it really unfolding quickly, even given like real estate slumps in some markets? Absolutely. I think in the last two, three years, we are seeing much more real estate asset owners start thinking about it, start kind of, it's a real risk for them. Uh, plus the commitment that you are making to the society that I'm gonna be net zero. So we are seeing definitely uh, acceleration in the momentum. Is it at the right level? We think it can be two times, three times faster, even more. And that's what sort of our call to action by being present in such forums to say, it's not a problem of technology. It's a problem of real, leadership actually and be decisive about taking those actions. So I think momentum is there. We need to increase the momentum by two, three times, you know. Hi, you've touched on this a bit and maybe I'd like to bring it together around data. Um, as you alluded to, a lot of particularly small and medium sized buildings don't have systems. They have no control systems maybe the best thing they have is the, if they're lucky, a smart meter, right, yeah. on the building. And so a first glimpse into a building's operation is, is, has been mentioned here too, could be through better access to that smart meter data. And yet I've seen over the last several years, right, access to the data from utilities in certain markets, right, has become more challenging, not easier. And I was wondering if you have any sort of thoughts on that, right? Getting customer acquisition is tough, right? But everybody's got a, a meter. And how do we overcome that obstacle so we can kind of get even more momentum going so that companies like yours can get in there and, and get things done? Uh, I, I was just going to say, I, I think that the smaller, at least for me, the smaller the building, the less likely they have any you know, infrastructure in place. Um, but the approach that we've taken is to not wait on anybody else and create you know, this combination of equipment, software, and services and bundle it together but not make anyone pay for it up front. Uh, it's, you know, it's not free, it's included. And just get the infrastructure in place to get the data. You know, I'll mimic your journey there of, of, of uh, there are three steps, but the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step and that's being in the building and actually having data about what the consumption is, but also controlling. Because if you're gonna reduce, you have to control. You can't just have visibility. You have to actually tie it to control. So for us, out of the gate, step one, day one, every day, it is um, get the equipment in the site to also control the assets of today and set up for the assets of the future. Because the assets of the future are the energy storage systems, the EV chargers outside, and you wanna be set up and take an entire whole building approach with every single building that's out there, both big and small. And I would say to complement, uh, I think the small, medium-sized building, actually even larger, we, we have a real problem of trained technicians, uh, facility manager, electrician, plumber. So I think digital technologies have a bigger role to play to take a lot of those barriers out. I take an example of instead of pulling wires and installing stuff, you can do wireless stuff, right? So there you go. Mm -hmm. You don't need to think about, you know, pulling the wires, installing. Uh, Cloud has kind of you know, helped in that way as well. So you can actually send maybe less trained, less skilled technicians on the site to deploy some of those things and then have the data flow back into the, the cloud. And the advantage with cloud and AI and all those things is you can you know, bring some of those uh, learnings into the system itself that can augment a less trained technician. So it's absolutely uh, a you know, role of technology to simplify 
and you know, accelerate by compensating of less trained technician. Coming back to your point, we can extract data easily from meters, wireless connectivity. Same thing, we can put more simpler controller technology to be able to take action as well when you detect inefficiencies. So all of that is possible. As I said, coming back to question of leadership, question of sometimes a business model adjustment for building owners as well. Uh, the question I have is that uh, it was very clear to me from your presentation, from your discussions, uh, the incentive for the facility owner. Uh, however, most of the commercial facilities that we see nowadays are operated by a third party. So there is a third party who is an operation facility, like facility managers you talked about, Mr. Kamar. Uh, now, with your solutions, I, I anticipate that this market will be less profitable for them. So how do you uh, incentivize those facility operators to make to adopt the energy efficient practices and within the buildings they operate in. And I would say the way we are approaching, and you know, there are probably just not a one uh, approach, uh, probably answer. The way we are thinking is we want to really create what I call strategic ecosystem and partnership. So we are working with some of the leading facility managers, and of course, at the same time, the asset owners and end users, because we have a vested interest. End users want to meet their decarbonization goals. They want to also reduce their energy. But the operational side of it, tactical, has to get done through the facility teams, right? So we are also partnering with facility teams to say, your customers are requiring that. We can help you with the technology so that we can build some of these things together. There is alignment between technology provider, the person who owns the asset, and the, the people who are deploying the technology and day-to-day -day basis taking action. So I think there is a triangulation of that possible, and that's what we are trying to achieve with some of the leading asset owners as well as facility providers. You know? And we see good outcome coming out progressively. Uh, I see the needle moving. You know? I, the only thing I would add is, um, on top of everything that you just said, you know, find the person that's paying the bill and they're gonna care about energy efficiency because um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business owner that has a bill to pay and energy it costs money and costs more and you know, f follow the money and find the person that cares about the bill. Um, find the person that cares about the sustainability objective, bring them together, and try and bring those parties together to drive, yeah. drive forward. Thank you. <clears throat> My uh, question is for Manish. I, I remember being at, at Zero Week uh, 10 or 12 years ago and, and listening to Jim Rogers, who was at that time the CEO of Duke. And he used to talk about a future, but the technology did not yet exist. And of course, he was coming from the utility perspective, so he was speaking as a utility CEO, saying that in the future, he thought utilities would offer uh, commercial customers um, climatized air as a service, for example. And um, you know, very, basically, he would say, people don't, my customers don't wake up wanting to buy my product. Um, they wake up wanting to have cold air, warm air, hot water, motive force, illumination, cell phone charging, things that my product enables. And he would talk about the, the future of the utility in the context of smart grid as uh, an evolution of the business model where the utility would someday be able to leverage this type of technology to, um, to offer more as a service sort of models to customers. And so my, my question for you is, so as, as you move forward the digital energy agenda at Schneider, and as you digitize more and more buildings and you, you achieve this, yeah. do you, how do you and how does Schneider think about, um, I mean, for example, if you're integrating batteries, right, you're obviously not just selling the customer a, a battery, but you're offering them the benefit of an on-site energy storage for backup, for arbitraging the grid. How do you guys think about evolving the commercial relationship with customers um, and maybe taking over more of the, the distributed infrastructure behind the meter because as Mark was saying earlier, you know, these, 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 these customers want to focus on their core value prop to their customers and not necessarily worry so much about HVAC or a lot of these necessary infrastructure they have. Yeah. And I would say, uh, you know, you brought a good point. We are, we are a technology company. We want to focus on technology, keeping the, you know, uh, keep innovating, facilitating a much more flexible gridware, local generation, centralized generation, they can play and integrate well. And in some cases, you know, our customers are owners, but some cases our customers are utilities actually because some of the progressive utilities, they are saying we should be in the business of distributed 
local generation as well. So they are actually getting into the scheme of, I'm going to own this asset, I'm going to sign a PPA with a local uh, facility uh, owner and provide them you know, uh, the green electricity. So we are happy to partner with utilities, we are happy to partner with the owner, and sometimes actually we facilitate a business model where we are a technology provider, but there is an agreement between the owner as well as the utility as well. So we, we're going to you know, continue to focus on what I call is uh, technology around automation control, analytics, and facilitating that ecosystem so that customers or end user who have a goal of net zero, who have a goal of saving energy, that's achievable, and whatever it takes to, to make that happen. Any more questions? Um, oh, we have one at the back here. Thank you. So I just want to ask, um, I guess for both of you, there's, it's sort of, maybe I'm wrong, but a new product class, like some equipment that's going to go bi-directionally. Because normally you just push the energy out to the customer. What are the new products that you're selling that enable a business or a residential customer to sell back? Like, what do you need to do that? So I, I can speak uh, two or three examples. Uh, talk about bi-directional uh, specifically, and there is a bi-direction of electricity, but there is a bi-direction of control and automation at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. So I would say on our side, what we are trying to do is on microgrid facilitating that bi-directional exchange of both electrons and information control depending on the energy prices, storage, uh, as well as production local, so you can optimize. The second one is, uh, if you look at just the building automation technology and you know, uh, optimization of your HVAC systems or other systems in the building, today, uh, I would say, you know, historically it has been monitoring. You monitor, right? But now, I think it's also possible, and that's where we are bringing technology ecostructure, where you can analyze at a portfolio level of buildings, where your inefficiencies are happening, be able to direct back the control and create some of those virtual power plant type of resources, demand response business model. And a lot of this is kind of becoming possible thanks to advancement in fundamental applied technology that sits in the buildings. You know. I would just add that our, our emphasis is significantly on the virtual power within the building. So not actually pushing it back, but uh, providing reliable virtual power to the utility, the market in various programs. And um, as we continue down the transition, I think the pricing constructs and the tariffs and the grid services programs are gonna continue to expand. Um, the time of use spreads will continue to grow. The uh, locational nature and need uh, for specific grid services, not broad, but very fine-tuned, will yeah. continue to happen. And the only way to enable that virtual power is through technology and knowing which assets which buildings, which feeder lines, which areas, which geographies, in which markets at which time, and thinking of that as a, a massive you know, artificial intelligence sort of decision logic tree that says, where do we need it? Let's, let's, let's provide that virtual power to take the edge off the supply and demand imbalance, which is gonna continue to grow as we make the transition. Yeah, Bill Emuka is my name. I'm wondering if um, if there exists or maybe would exist a business model for a third party between you as the provider of uh, technology and an independent person who wants to build a business between you and the grid owners, that kind of. I'm not sure I understood the question. So, uh, you want to... Is there a role for an intermediary between the, um, say, the grid itself and the business that, that Mark can manage? Yes, yeah. yes. So for me, if I want to you know, build a business between what you offer and what the uh, uh, grid offers and the customer, potential customer, so does uh, that role exist, or will it exist? Absolutely. I mean, I will take two or three examples. Uh, these are still in the early stages of development of the market. I take energy as a service, where somebody can build a microgrid. They will own the asset. They can provide the service. So in that case, you are almost sitting between the asset owner, building owner. You are sitting between a technology provider or utility, but you can own that asset and provide energy as a service. That's kind of the one 
example. The second one could be virtual power plant, where you don't own the asset, you are orchestrating the distributed uh, energy resources and creating the surplus and aggregating at a central level and making that capacity available for resiliency or for the reuse cases. So you are, again, uh, in the middle between asset owner and the utility, but creating that virtual power plant through technology and aggregating that. Uh, so that's another business model and market possible. And we see the early signs of development of that market. Yeah, I would say we're a little bit of a different direction. You know, the smaller the building, I think the less room there is for a lot of multiple players to be involved. So our intention is to do, is to be not just behind the meter controlling the building and providing those services to the end customer, but to also, um, you know, aggregate that load and play, to play a direct role in the grid services program directly as much as, as much as practical and possible. You know, with the caveat and asterisk that, you know, every market is different and there's a lot of different requirements and sometimes you have to, um, work, you know, work collaboratively, but we want, we think the smaller the building, the more likely you have to do, do multiple things at once and, and tie it all together. Cool. Thank you. Mark, you've, you've talked about 70% of the buildings are under 50,000 square feet, and it feels like, a, as we've talked about 2030 and, and the momentum with technology and regulation, that, that there's kind of a plan to address the bigger buildings. Um, I'm curious, by 2030, what percent of those smaller buildings under 50,000 square feet do you think will have smart controls for energy efficiency? And, and my guess is, if that's a, a relatively small number, what's it going to take to increase it by orders of magnitude? Pat, I, I completely agree. I, I, I don't have an exact percentage of the market to share with you, but as much as possible. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we certainly think that the, the smaller the buildings, you know, the, particularly the 70% below 10,000 square feet, there's just not a lot of penetration of the technology. And so I think it's sort of really wide open space to, to add a lot of technology in these buildings and aggregate them together and provide a, a sort of this networked virtual capacity, um, which is really what we're trying to do, create a distributed virtual power plant of lots of buildings together, essentially. Uh, and I think the way to um, encourage that as much as possible is you know, A, you know, take the bull by the horns, we're in Texas, take the bull by the horns ourselves and make it as easy as possible through the business model to get people to take it on, but also take advantage of ma as many of these sort of in incentives and, um, you know, traditional demand response as well as other good services incentives as possible and, you know, really, you know, provide a sort of a net effective lower and lower and lower and lower rate to the end customer so that they're, you know, I don't know if it'd be completely free, but get it as much as possible so that it's you're, you're almost giving it away to, to get customers to drive adoption. People Just respond to pricing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll react to that too. I think people respond to knowing that there, there is anything to do in their building. And I'm kind of yes. pushing back to my original comment, which is, you know, it's great to have a grid point out there, but Either you have to find me or I have to find you. Yeah. And but I didn't. I, I'm going to assume my building's fine, you know, because yeah. I don't know anything else, right? Yeah. There's, unless I'm in a territory that has a progressive utility who might yeah. be saying your energy usage is higher than your neighbors or yeah. something along those lines. It's it, we're really in this very kind of uneducated place that that really, in my opinion, needs a lot of attention yeah. before we can get I, your technologies I, into those. I, I totally agree, and that's where I think you know education and you know course marketing, you know, to all these customers to educate them on the opportunity. I think every business owner, no matter who you are, you want to save money in the face of rising cost. you you know every day is a is a battle to do more with less and you know create more margin spread on your fundamental business and drive revenue. Um, so every CFO under the sun is looking at how can I improve you know my PL for my business, my site, my company. And and so we'd have to find those people and show them, hey, hey, one of the things you can do is focus on energy efficiency and here's all the ways you can do it. So I, I think getting the word out is is absolutely essential to what we're trying to do. And um, that's where partnerships with the, the utilities, I think, can help to market opportunities for some of the programs. Um, and everything that everyone can do out there to raise the profile of like, hey, don't just focus on the supply side of the equation, focus on demand, aka efficiency, and aka saving money. And if I may compliment, I think uh, if we think about those building owners, you have large owners which are a franchise of buildings, and then they're independent, right? I would say, taking example of Europe, the energy prices and crises actually is pinching 
the smaller because it has a real impact on your cost. Yeah. So you actually are forced to engage with the problem to say, how do I manage my cost? And energy is a big cost in their operation. Their P&L is already, the margins are not huge. So you have a real impact. So you're engaging. Uh, second part is coming back to the more professional franchise owner. They're taking commitment on net zero. If you're taking a commitment on net zero, and the first thing you're saying is, I'm going to be scope one and two, uh, net zero, uh, scope one and two reduced by 2030, the big scope of that is your operations, right? And buildings are a big part of that. So then you are engaging a problem from that angle as well. To your point, it's happening, but definitely there is a much more room to improve of education, marketing, and telling the stories out that it's possible you can actually really benefit from it as well. Yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of people, they want to invest in efficiency, but they don't know how. They don't know how to do it, so we have to help them yep. see the light. On that note, I think we're up against time. And before we go, I think we need to put you in touch with the uh, facilities manager of the George R. Brown Center and, and the Hilton as well. So, so <laughs> this, this time next year, it'll be a completely different environment. Um, but thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate the engagement and appreciate the contributions from Manish and Mark. And this time next year, there will be an energy efficiency hub in the Agora Innovation Center. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Yep.